Hi, y'all, and welcome to tonight's live stream. There are only two things that everybody agrees on about that night of January 29th, 2022. The first is that Boston police officer John O'Keefe's body was found frozen in the snow outside a home at 34 Fairview Road the next morning on January 30th. And it was in Canton, Massachusetts. The second thing everybody agrees on is that John O'Keefe was a great guy who had taken his niece and nephew in when they were orphaned and was raising them on his own. Beyond those two things, there really is not agreement. But there are, there are huge, in fact, disagreements about just how John O'Keefe came to be lying lifeless in the snow. Prosecutors say O'Keefe was murdered by his girlfriend, Karen Reed. They say the two had been arguing and were on the cusp of breaking up. She mowed him down and left him to die. But her lawyers and a large group in the public believe she is being set up to take the fall for a murder that someone else committed. They say John O'Keefe went into the house at 34 Fairview Road and inside he was attacked, beaten up, and then dragged outside to freeze to death. Two very different stories, both horrendous, but which is true. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So welcome, everybody. Um, if you haven't hit that like button, please do. If And if you haven't subscribed, we would love to have you as a subscriber to the channel. Hit that button. Totally free to do both of those things, and we would love to have you. I want to give a special shout out to the first five in the chat, Drew P., Jeb, Jackie, Camille's Rando fan, and Chris. Welcome. Special welcome to you and a shout out. So thanks for coming. Karen Reed supporters have been very vocal. They turn out in force at hearings in her case. Throngs cheer for her as she enters the courtroom, waving signs that say things like free Karen Reed. She is greeted by supporters outside the courtroom, and then the crowd applauds when she comes into the courtroom. I wanted to show you this little clip. I've never seen anything like it before. And shouts, I love you. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> I have never seen anything remotely like that. And that controversy has spilled over into the local government. Canton residents voted to audit their own police department. Let me show you one of the articles um, about that. The, so the city voted to audit its own police department because of co this controversy and because of being uncertain about whether or not they could trust their own police department. A YouTuber, Turtle Boy, who has staunchly defended Karen Reed and insisted that she was set up, was himself charged with conspiracy. We'll take a look at one of the articles, one of the many articles about that. Turtle Boy blogger faces expanded charges in new grand jury indictment, special prosecutor says. And his supporters are adamant that he's being targeted. And the reason he's being targeted is because he's been vocal about supporting Karen Reed. The amount of controversy in this case is really unusual. Let me go ahead and pull that out so I can talk to y'all a little better. Now, it's a big case with a lot of nuance. We had to start somewhere, and we started on this case last week looking at a hearing on two motions filed by Karen Reed's lawyers. Now, by definition, those were mostly related to things that helped Karen Reed because they were motions filed by her side of the case. Tonight, I want to go deeper into the allegations against Karen Reed. What exactly does the prosecutor say she did? What evidence do they have? And where does Karen Reed disagree with that? Tonight is story night, not so much legal night. We're doing a deep dive into the facts. Many of the points through here will be agreed on by both sides, but the main theme is figuring out what the prosecution is charging Karen Reed with doing and what they claim she did. What are the charges? What did they say happened? And where does Karen disagree with that? If you've been following the case for years, you may know arguments that 
you know about that I missed. And please let me know. I'm trying to flesh this out for all of us so we can understand the case as it goes forward. And I definitely want to get it right. So write me, let me know about that. For some of you, it may be frustrating hearing me talk about the other side and what the other side says happened if you feel like you already have a good grasp of what happened. Believe you me, I fully understand that because one of the things that has always been hardest for me in the practicing law is reading the other side's briefs when they come in. It is so frustrating because they tell the judge that you're wrong, that what you said was wrong. They cite to all these points that I think are completely BS. They cite to cases that don't say what they say they do. It's a very frustrating experience. But here is what I have learned. I cannot win a motion unless I understand the other side's argument. I can't make my strongest argument until I have figured out what the other side's strongest arguments are. So even if you have an opinion, let's find out what the claims are and understand what the case is about. So at 6 a.m. on January 29, 2022, a blizzard was raging in Canton, Massachusetts. Snow was pelting down and the temperature was only in the teens. For the police, things began at 6.04 a.m. when a woman called Canton's 911 and police dispatched officers Saraf and Mullaney to check out claims that a body had been found in the snow. When Saraf and Mullaney arrived, they saw three women standing in the front yard at the left corner of the property near a flagpole and a hydrant. Let me show you a photograph of that. Actually, yeah, I'll, I'll show you a photograph. This is that house, and you can see here, uh, have I added it? Yes. Nope, but I'm not on the right one. Why am I not on the right one? Here we go. Well, <laughs> tell you what, I will share the screen over here. I will stop that screen share, share another screen that will show you the house. Okay, here we go. Here's the house. And you can see in the picture that there's a flagpole there. You can see in the foreground, Robert, I want to thank you so much for the super sticker. And in fact, for two of them, I'm going to take your note off so that people can see that. But thank you very much. You can see in the foreground that, and it's actually maybe a little difficult to see, but there's a fire hydrant right there. You can see the flagpole, and it was right in that area that law enforcement found the body of John O'Keefe. Now let's get back into what happened. And I will go back out. Okay. So, um, and thank you, Robert. I'll put your other super sticker up. Thank you for both of those. I appreciate that. So the three women who were by the body turned out to be Karen Reed, Jennifer McCabe, and Carrie Rod Roberts, and they waved the police officer over. According to prosecutors, Karen Reed and one of the other women were performing CPR on a man lying in the snow, John O'Keefe. I believe that Karen later would say that she was the only person performing CPR. But John O'Keefe was cold to the touch and he wasn't breathing. Paramedics with the Canton EMS transported him to Good Samaritan Medical Center and brought to Massachusetts, but it was too late. Dr. Justin Rice declared O'Keefe dead. According to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Three Canton police officers, Lieutenant Paul Gallagher, Detective Sergeant Michael Lank, and Sergeant Sean Good, arrived just moments after the 911 call was made. Michael Lank becomes an important figure in the case. The defense claims he had a relationship with some potential suspects, and that relationship should have been disclosed to the grand jury that indicted Karen Reed but it wasn't disclosed. That's one of the reasons the defense says that the indictment against Karen Reed should be thrown out. But let's keep going with what happened that night. The Canton police officers searched the area where the body had been found. 
They discovered a broken cocktail style glass and multiple patches of red that appeared to be blood. They secured the glass and six blood samples from the snow as evidence. Later that morning, troopers from the Massachusetts State Police Detective Unit of the Norfolk District Attorney's Office were called to the scene. Most notably, Trooper Michael Proctor and Sergeant Yuri Buknik showed up at the scene. Karen's team would later say that Proctor had an even closer relationship to some of the potential suspects than Michael Lank did, and that Proctor and Butnik intentionally withheld that information. The defense says Proctor's involvement and the fact the grand jury wasn't told about it is yet another reason that the court needs to dismiss the indictment against Karen Reed. It seems there may be some teeth to these allegations for this reason. The state and federal authorities appear to be investigating Proctor, although the investigations for now remain pretty much shrouded in mystery. We do not know a lot about it or uh, what charges would come from it, if any. So on that winter morning in January 2022, police began working backwards, asking the question, where had John O'Keefe been the night before he died? And they discovered that the woman giving him CPR was his girlfriend, Karen Reed. Karen and John had been dating for about two years. Karen stayed at John's house most nights, and uh, according to his niece and nephew who lived with him. On John's final night on earth, Karen and John had been drinking at local bars, and they started the evening at C.F. McCarthy's. And at about 11, they walked across the street to the Waterfall Bar and Grill. So let me stop sharing that screen, and I will share another screen with you uh, so you can see what I'm talking about. So right here, this is C.F. McCarthy's, the bar where they started the evening, and then just right down the street, they were at the Waterfall Bar and Grill. And that's where they were that night. Of course, it was a lot colder than you see in these pictures because it was January just outside Boston, Massachusetts. And let me assure you, it is seriously cold in Boston, Massachusetts. So Jennifer was, sorry, Jennifer, um, John O'Keefe was a Boston police officer and he spotted a fellow police officer, I'll pull that out, spotted a fellow police officer, Brian Albert, who was at the Waterfall Bar, the new bar they had gone to, with a group of friends and relatives. And Jennifer McCabe was one of the people in that group. According to Jennifer McCabe, Karen Reed brought a glass containing a clear liquid into the waterfall bar tucked inside her coat. Now, Jennifer believed that the glass held a vodka soda. Karen denies taking a drink into the waterfall bar at all. Karen and John joined the group and they all hung out for about an hour until the bar was closing. Jennifer McCabe told police that Karen and John seemed to be in a good mood. They were not arguing, although troopers Proctor and Butnik would later say that Karen told them that John and she had had a fight that morning over what Karen had fed John's niece for breakfast. John O'Keefe's niece and nephew, ages 10 and 14, had lived with him for eight years since they were orphaned. One of the children said that John and Karen argued, quote, a decent amount of time, uh, according to the nephew, and quote, a lot, which to a 14-year-old apparently meant approximately two to three times a week. After a recent argument, John had even asked Karen to leave the house, according to what the niece and nephew have said, at least what it's been reported they said, but she refused to do that. The niece heard John tell Karen that their relationship had run its course and that it isn't healthy. The police say cell phone data confirms that Karen and John were in the middle of a big fight the night he died. Let me add this back to the stage and show you the document. On January 29th, the troopers also recovered Mr. O'Keefe's cell phone and were subsequently able to forensically extract the data from said phone. Their forensic extraction of the call logs, voicemails, and text messages between the victim and the defendant, including the date of January 28th to 29th, 
I think I said 29, 30 or earlier. I meant 28, 29. Detailed strains within their relationship, the victim's desire to end their relationship, and the defendant's description of their relationship with them and the two children together as toxic. The troopers recovered several voicemails from the victim's phone from the defendant. Following the time frame, they were in front of the residence at 34 Fairview in which the defendant screamed to the victim that she hated him. So that is, um, in a nutshell, what the prosecution says proves that Karen and John were fighting. One of the open questions in the case is whether Karen Reed was drunk on the night that John died. Several people, including an acquaintance, uh, Karina Kolakathis. Um, oh, I think it's, I, I've been trying to say this today, Kolakathis. How about that? I don't know for sure. Maybe, maybe if someone knows, you can tell me how. Kolakathis sounds so good. I hope that's it. Um, who saw Karen at the bar said Karen was drinking vodka and soda, vodka soda cocktails that night. And um, Karina offered some ambivalent testimony. On the one hand, she said that Karen complained about John O'Keefe's mother. Karen also said she and John never got enough private vacation time, what with the kids' busy schedules in school. Obviously, those points could help the prosecution. But on the other hand, Karina also said that she thought Karen was just fine and she didn't seem intoxicated, which of course would help the defense. Um, okay, so just how much did Karen drink? Police got video from CF McCarthy's and they say Karen Reed was served seven drinks. I did a little chart for you based on what I read in the government's brief. That isn't what I actually add up, but I'm. you can... You can see for yourself what, what you see. Prosecute. Oh, no, we don't want to end yet. That won't do. Here we go. Okay. So you can see for yourself. Oh, wait. Ah, cancel. Okay. Timeline. Here we go. So this is what the prosecution said. At 8.58, a bartender hands Karen a tall cylinder style glass with a clear liquid and a lime. Then at 9.15, John O'Keefe hands Karen a cylinder style glass with a clear liquid and a lime. So she's drinking the same thing all night is what the prosecution is suggesting. At 9.20, she received a shot glass with a clear liquid, which she pours into her cylinder glass. And at 9.33, receives a shot glass with a clear liquid, pours it into her cylinder glass. Then at 9.57 was a double incident. The bartender handed her a tall cylinder glass with a clear liquid and a lime and also a shot glass with a clear liquid in it. So I put that in twice so you can see that that's two different things. 10.22, another shot glass. 10.29, another shot glass. And 10.40, a tall cylinder style glass. I add those up to nine, but the prosecution says it was seven drinks. So whichever, it was a significant amount. It was a significant amount of drinks that she had that night is what the prosecution is arguing. Now, the as Karen leaves C.F. McCarthy's bar at 10.40 p.m., she's seen on video holding her last drink in her right hand, which would contradict what she said earlier about she didn't bring one into the other bar. 14 minutes later, cameras pick up Karen walking into the Waterfall Bar, 10.54 p.m., and people, um, in, and they hang out together in the group. People in the group then were reluctant to shut down the party. According uh, to Karina, Karen pushed for the group to cross the street and get one of the members of their group, Chris Albert, to open up his pizza shop and make some pizza for them. Eventually, what happened was that everybody got invited to an after party at the home of Nicole and Brian Albert. That's the home I showed you earlier with the flagpole. Nicole is Jennifer McCabe's sister. So Karen walked out of the bar, the Waterfall Bar, at 12.10 p.m. with two other women. John took a last swallow from his glass and walked out the front door of the bar, still holding the glass in his right hand. Cameras showed a light coating of snow on the ground. Karen told troopers that her stomach had begun hurting at the second bar. 
She told troopers she dropped John O'Keefe off at the party, made a three-point turn, and headed home. That three-point turn becomes controversial, and there is dispute over that. Karen says she saw John heading up the steps of the house, going into the party. The people inside the home say he never arrived. He never got there. And the state says his phone remained, remained stationary. But Karen Reed's team says that his phone recorded him going up steps, which would suggest that he went into the house. According to a forensic toxicologist from the Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab, at 9.08 a.m. the next morning, Karen Reed's blood alcohol was 0.07 to 0.08. He calculated backwards and concluded her blood alcohol level would have been between a 0 0.13 and 0 0.29 at 1245 a.m. when she was dropping John off. Now, Karen says that throughout the night, she tried to text and call John, but he just didn't respond. The prosecution acknowledges that this is true, that she did try to reach him. I'm, let me pull that out and just talk to y'all. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, but Karen Reed was not the only person who was up that night. Karen Reed's lawyers say that a number of people connected to the group inside that house were up and they were texting and calling one another. The Reed team is trying to get additional cell phone records. There was a hearing today about that. Reed's lawyers also say that at 227, one of the people inside the house, Jennifer McCabe, you've heard her name, did a Google search for Haas Long to Die in Cold, or they believe How Long to Die in Cold, slightly misspelled. So back to that statement I told you to bookmark. Remember that Jennifer says that Karen Reed asked her to do that search. Well, I don't think I said that to you earlier. Sorry. <laughs> um, Jennifer says Karen Reed asked her to do that search, but Karen Reed's team says that actually Jennifer did that search herself hours earlier and she deleted it. They claim Jennifer only did the search again at six o'clock in order to try to frame Karen and cast suspicion away from Jennifer or the people from inside the home. Now, the state initially looked at Jennifer McCabe's phone or Karen's phone and saw Jennifer McCabe's phone and saw that two searches were done after 6 a.m. But when the defense redid the searches with a newer version of the program used to extract the data, they found a search for the same thing, essentially the same words, at 2.27 a.m., Karen wasn't around, and the only reason the state had not found it, they say, is that Jennifer had tried to delete it. So the defense says the FBI has confirmed that the defense is right, that the search was first done at 2.27 a.m. This fact is going to be hugely important because Karen Reed was not at the home at 2.27 a.m. Karen Reed's team sees this as absolute proof that the people inside the home were responsible for murdering John. So let's go back to Karen Reed and what happened with her that morning. John's 14-year-old niece said that at approximately 4.30 a.m., she was awoken by Karen Reed screaming and acting frantic. Karen Reed tried texting and calling John O'Keefe using the niece's phone. At 4.53 a.m., Karen Reed got her niece to call Jennifer McCabe, and then the niece handed the phone to Karen. According to police, the niece says that Karen changed her story several times on the phone. Initially, Karen Reed said she and John O'Keefe got into an argument and she dropped him off. Karen was distraught because John wasn't home. But for sure, by five in the morning, Karen was distraught because he wasn't home. Where was he? At around 5 a.m., Karen also called Carrie Roberts. Carrie says that Karen said John's dead. Carrie, Carrie, I wonder if he's dead. It's snowing. He got hit by a plow. Ring camera footage from John's house where Karen was staying showed Karen pulling out of the driveway at 5.08 a.m., apparently to go look for John. Now, importantly, one of the things that happens, and let me add this to the stage and show you the next photograph that I want to show you. <laughs> Give me just a minute. I'm getting dizzy. 
Okay, I don't think I can show you. I will have to find a different way. Um, it's simply, I'll just tell you what it was. Okay, so the, there was pieces of taillight from Karen's car were found, according to the police, near John O'Keefe's body. There is a lot of dispute over whether or not those taillight pieces were found there or planted there. But in backing out to leave to go look for John at five something in the morning, there is also a shot, Court TV got some exclusive footage of this from, I assume, the parties, that shows Karen backing out and hitting, very lightly tapping, it looks like, a car parked directly behind her right at the right taillight. That right taillight could have broken, they say, in her own driveway. That may be how it broke it. Not because she hit John O'Keefe with it, but because it simply broke right there in the driveway. And they say the police picked up those pieces, transported them to where John O'Keefe's body was found because Karen is the subject of a frame, a frame up that people are trying to set her up. So let's, uh, let me head back over to this. So as, in addition to that still, the police also grabbed footage. It was actually a, a short video from ring camera footage from John O'Keefe's home. Police also grabbed footage from the local library that showed that after Karen called Jennifer McCabe, she headed out toward the waterfall bar at 5.11 a.m. and then back in the other direction at 5.15 a.m., presumably going to look at the waterfall bar to see if John was there. Now, Karen drove over to Jennifer McCabe's home after this. She got there about 5.30 a.m. and said that the last time she could remember seeing John was at the waterfall bar, which would, be, would make sense given that that's where she went looking for him. Jennifer informed Karen, well, Karen, you and John left the bar together and you, I saw you parked outside the Alberts home on 34 Fairview Road. According to Jennifer McCabe, Karen said John and she had gotten into an argument the last time they were together. Carrie Roberts showed up at Jennifer McCabe's house shortly after this. Carrie said she believed Karen was still intoxicated, even though it was the next morning. And Karen said she didn't remember the night before. According to Carrie, Karen told Jennifer, I was so drunk, I don't even remember going to your sister's last night. In other words, Karen was saying she didn't recall going to 34 Fairview Road at all the night before. By now, Karen was too hysterical to drive safely. So Jennifer McCabe drove Karen's vehicle from Jennifer's house back to John O'Keefe's house and Carrie Roberts followed in her vehicle. Jennifer McCabe and Karen Reed were alone in the car. So they are the only two who can talk about what happened. Jennifer claims that Karen said at this point, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? Karen also mentioned that she had a cracked taillight on her vehicle and pointed out the cracked passenger side right rear taillight to both Jennifer and Carrie, who noticed pieces were missing. Jennifer McCabe and Karen Reed then got out of their car and shifted over to Carrie Roberts' car to go look for John. Jennifer and Carrie agree. Karen Reed was sitting in the back passenger side, which may seem like a small point, but hang on to that fact for just a minute. They say Karen was texting and periodically screaming as they drove. So their car turns onto Fairview Road. It's still snowing heavily, wind was gusting, and Carrie Roberts said it was a near whiteout. Visibility was terrible, but suddenly Karen screamed, there he is, I see him. Jennifer and Carrie are looking through the snow. Neither of them, they say, can see anything. Karen screamed to let her out, and she ran straight to John O'Keefe. He was lying face up, and she lay on him to warm him up and started CPR. Carrie and Jennifer got out of the car too. Carrie said that when she first got out, she still couldn't see the body, which was covered in snow. And according to Carrie, about 12 feet away from the street, which would suggest that it was not on a three point turn that he got hit or that he ended up there. The implication the prosecution would make with this is that Karen had to have known that the body was there in advance and she was only pretending to spot it through the falling snow. 
Carrie began helping with CPR. According to Jennifer McCabe, John O'Keefe had half a foot of snow on top of him. His phone was on the ground underneath him. McCabe says that Karen yelled to her twice to Google, how long do you have to be left outside to die from hypothermia? This is another critical point, as we talked about earlier. Paramedics lifted John O'Keefe onto a stretcher, and Carrie Roberts noticed that there was grass that was not covered in snow beneath him. Karen Reed asked everyone over and over, is he dead? Carrie Roberts said Karen grabbed her arm and asked if paramedics were really working on John or was he already dead? Firefighter Katie McLaughlin said that John O'Keefe had trauma to his face and eye area. Remember the trauma part of that statement. She also said John had vomit in his mouth and was wearing only one shoe. Firefighter McLaughlin asked Karen Reed what happened and says Karen turned to her friend and said repeatedly, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. The autopsy photos show that John O'Keefe had eyes that were black and blue and swollen shut. The right eyelid was cut. He had blood and vomit on his boxer shorts and a gash on the back of his head. He was wearing a single black Nike sneaker. The autopsy showed that John O'Keefe had multiple skull fractures. Since the pancreas was dark red, the medical examiner concluded that hypothermia was a contributing factor to his death, meaning that one of the reasons for his death was that he froze to death. The medical examiner said she saw no signs of John O'Keefe being involved in a physical fight. That's going to be important too. She testified that the blow to the back of the head is what caused the multiple skull fractures and the blood that seeped them from small blood vessels and caused the eyes to look swollen and black and purple. A neuropathology report reached similar findings according to what the state claims. I personally was surprised that the medical examiner saw no evidence that he'd been in a fight. The autopsy photographs, which are available, but I, which I'm not gonna show, uh, do look to me like someone who had been beaten up, but the medical examiner admittedly knows more than I do and disagrees. But probably the single most discussed injury to John O'Keefe was very dramatic scratches were cuts on his forearm. The defense suggests these are dog scratches. They say that John O'Keefe was attacked by the family dog inside the house, that he went into the party and got into a, someone, fought him, the defense insisted that those scratches be tested per canine DNA. The prosecution has now said that the results were negative, that the cuts had no canine DNA. We don't have results. That's what the prosecution has said. We don't know what Karen Reed's response to that will be. But regardless of whether they were caused by a dog, I will say that they don't really seem like they would match something that would be underneath a car. It, do, it does seem odd. They, and you would think that the police could match up something on the underbelly of the car that Karen was driving with these scratches that would look exactly like that. So far, we haven't been told whether any of that has happened or even could happen. One of the most dramatic developments in the past week has been news that the federal government is investigating something to do with the case. We aren't exactly sure what. Today, today several of the people whose phone records Karen Reed's team wanted announced they were not targets of that federal investigation. One person, instead of saying that, said they had not testified to the federal grand jury, which was a little different, and I was curious about why that is. So, um, but last week, Karen Reed's lawyers announced that a reconstructionist hired by the federal government believed Karen Reed had not been hit by a car, and that that was the conclusion of an expert used by the federal government. The day that John O'Keefe's body was discovered, troopers seized Karen Reed's car and confirmed that the right rear passenger side tail light was shattered. Pieces were missing. The right rear had a deep scratch and a minor dent. Troopers tried putting the vehicle in reverse toward a dummy placed behind the car, and they found that alarms went off as they were supposed to do. A human hair was found on the right passenger side 
quarter panel. And no results of testing have been announced yet as to whether or not that could be confirmed to belong to John O'Keefe. Later on January 29th, state police dug through the snow and found the missing black snow out, sorry, missing black shoe outside the house. They found two pieces of broken red taillight and a piece of clear plastic taillight. That was consistent with the broken taillight from Karen Reed's Lexus. Troopers Evan Brandt and Proctor went to John O'Keefe's house and looked in the driveway and said they didn't see any fragments of taillight there in the driveway. Now, weeks later, the chief of police for Canton claimed to discover yet more fragments in the yard at the Alberts' home. Karen Reed says Trooper Proctor and the chief of police intentionally moved pieces of taillight in order to frame her. And they find it really suspicious that after all this searching and looking at the scene, suddenly, all this time later, more fragments were found. These are two very stark and contradictory stories. And they leave us with a really important question. Is Karen Reed a murderer or is she being framed? Two critically important facts, I think, to note are that Canton voted to audit its own police, which I think would have to be seen as a vote that they aren't really sure whether to believe their own police department. And now Karen Reed's team, as I mentioned earlier, are saying that the feds are weighing in on her side with everything from an investigation into most likely Trooper Proctor, but we don't know the details, to an accident reconstruction, saying that they don't see how John O'Keefe's injuries could have resulted from being hit by a car, to interpretation of the cell phone data and when that search was done by Jennifer McCabe. So over the coming weeks, we are going to be delving deeper into the mystery. Right now, if you would, go ahead and start putting your questions into the chat. And if you would put question marks at the beginning, it makes it a lot easier for me to find. So I would really appreciate that. I want to thank S. Hughes for the super sticker. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. And I also want to thank Zero Patience, which I understand that <laughs> sentiment. Uh, Zero is saying that... In Zero's opinion, this lady's being railroaded. So Zero is going ahead and thinking that this sounds a little, a little sus to Zero. So I am real curious what your thoughts are. We have we have we have started to get an understanding of what the facts are, but there's a lot more work to do. And trial, of course, hasn't even begun. This is what I'm able to glean just from what people have filed that's public. And by the way, a ton is not public and it's very frustrating. Okay, so I'm looking through for question marks and I see Annie K. Hey Annie. KR acts like a folk hero full of hub hubris, overconfident. How can her trial be balanced given so many pretrial accusations and appeals? Annie K, that it's gonna be uh it's gonna be quite uh, a difficult thing. Karen um this is a hotly contested case. There are emotions on either side. It reminds me more of the Johnny Depp Amber Heard than any other trial we've seen since then, where there's just a lot of emotion around it. Certainly with many other cases, we've seen a lot of people believing that the defendant was guilty, feeling strongly about that. This is different because we have a lot of emotion on both sides of the case. And usually the usually the public sentiment on behalf of the defendant is really not there. So this is very unusual. And okay, let's see. I am continuing to look for other questions. Thank you, uh, Annie Kay. Uh, Sky Ricky, could it be an accident from drunk driving? That's exactly what the prosecution is saying. One of the charges relates to what she, what happened not just murder, but the inclusion of intoxication. And they based that on their calculations of what exactly she had in her bloodstream ba based on their calculations from taking her blood the next morning. And they say, yeah, she was, she was drunk. In other words, the prosecution has thrown in some motive and they've suggested that there was this fight, maybe it was intentional, but honestly, that's not really necessary for their claims. 
that they've got a second degree murder and then they've uh, they've got issues around the intoxication. There doesn't really have to be a motive like I want to kill him in order for them to succeed. Scooter wants to know what motive would the people in the house have for killing John? <laughs> Indeed, I don't know. I don't know, Scooter. There were there was speculation that one of the people in the house had a long-standing dispute related to coming on to John's property. It was a young young person, I think not even over 18, someone younger, like a high school kid. So what motive would they have uh, for doing that, for killing John? Uh, honestly, we don't know. We don't have a motive. Glenda Kildow is asking me, can they pull data from the car to see if she dropped him off? I don't, I think the answer to that, Glenda, is yes, but I think she admits she dropped him off. Now, I don't think she's disputing that she dropped him off. And I think they would all agree that she dropped him off. The question is where he went after that. And I believe there's significant dispute over what his cell phone data shows about whether or not he went into the house, whether or not he went upstairs, or whether he remained stationary in the yard the entire time based on his phone. What does the police department have against Karen? Chris H. asked me. So as far as uh, what the police department has against Karen, I, I don't think that Karen would say initially they had anything against her. I think she would say they were trying to protect their own. And that the reason they did this was in order to protect her. Uh, sorry, in order, John O'Keefe was dead. Somebody they figured was going to take the fall and they didn't want it to be anybody with connections to the police de department. And the Alberts and other people in the party had connections to the police department. And that's why that was done. Jay Ross wants to know, what are the chances the indictment will be dismissed? So, Jay Ross, that is a really good question because of the fact there, there may be issues that the grand jury wasn't told specific things about Proctor's relationship, and there may be issues that they weren't told proper things about uh, Lank's relationship to some of the people involved. But the prosecution's argument was, look, that was this tiny little piece of what we presented to the grand jury. And usually it's really easy to get an indictment. There's not a whole lot of oversight. So it would be unusual for an indictment to ever be dismissed. On the other hand, it's an unusual case. And these are unusual allegations, particularly that the federal government is looking into that and looking into whether or not they are going to be, um, whether or not they're going to be bringing charges against anybody, presumably Proctor and presumably related to what he did in the investigation. But as I say, we know very little about that. And it's definitely something that we want to know more about. Okay. Um, Val, Val Hala wants to know, will I go over the defense story of the case equally? Oh, you can ask anybody in the chat who is a regular. They will tell you that I do both sides and, they can't stop me from doing that. So yes, and in fact, last, um, and this wasn't just, I, I think even in this video, I've tried to present both sides where I knew Karen's argument joined with what the state was saying. But what I wanted to do was present to you what is said happened that night. Now, all of this will be cast into doubt, up for grabs, up for people being asked to tell what happened when they actually get to trial, when witnesses show up and start testifying. So our last video related to a hearing where to uh, our last video on this case related to a hearing where the defense made two motions. So that was pretty heavily defense oriented because we were talking about what the defense had to say about how the grand jury was not given all the information that they should have been given. So we went kind of heavily into that. And now we're heavily into what is, what is everybody saying happened on that night? What are they saying happened to John O'Keefe? Because we have to start there. We can't kind of get into the nuance. We can't get into the law until we understand what the facts are and what everybody is claiming the facts are. Chris H wants to know, did he have a problem with a fellow officer? I'm not aware of that, Chris. But um, there are people who have done much work on this case who may can answer that. I don't know the answer, though. Do Lexus SUVs have teeth? I don't think so, Ariel. I assume Ariel is referring to the scratches on the arm. Nurse Riley, 
any discussion around the bar serving that many drinks? It is a lot. If that's how many they serve, that is a whole, whole lot. I don't know if they knew she was driving or had any idea about that. And of course, all we've got is a clear liquid, which theoretically could be water. Obviously, the prosecution doesn't think so. There may be bills that are presented to say how much was actually spent when we get to trial, but thus far not. Jim wants to know, Jim believes there's, um, how do they find jurors who haven't heard of this case? That is always a challenge, <laughs> always a challenge when it comes to a really notorious case, a small community. And in this case in particular, it will all be difficult. Hardcore Adorable asks, since they have alcohol data as to how much she was drinking, do they have the same for the other parties in the bar that are involved? I don't think so. I don't think they've looked into that. That I can't say that for sure. I'm just saying that it hasn't been presented that I've seen. Many more things may come out at trial, but my guess is that they didn't look at that. Lisa wants to know, when will we see the FBI report? Boy, that's the big question, isn't it? Because it seems like it could be very important, some of the information that comes out. Right now, we, we don't even really know exactly what they're looking into. The judge does. She's referred to communication from the U.S. attorney or the judge in the other case explaining what exactly is being looked at. I'm not sure who wrote her, but she mentioned she had a letter. So uh, Joan Kettlecamp wants to know, shoes come off when a person is hit by a car. That is a common thing, Joan. Yes, you're right. Could she be overcharged? Definitely possible um, that she is overcharged, that this was just something that happened very accidentally as she was doing a three-point turn. And I'm sure that's one of the things her lawyers will argue at, at some point when it comes to trial, that at most, for me, the fact that he was 12 feet away from the road is puzzling because she would, unless she just really knocked him 12 feet, how does he get there if he's hit by a car, unless the car goes up the curb, which seems unlikely. It seems like there were a lot of people around. It seems like somebody would have noticed something really strange like that. Okay. I think I'll take like two more questions. Uh, Michael wants to know, could we be looking at vehicular manslaughter? Yes. Uh, that is one of the charges very possibly. Marlo, uh, Marlo by design wants me to talk about the Michelle Traconis contempt hearing being held tomorrow on March 21st. So that is an absolutely fascinating issue, Marlo by design. And I have been wondering if we're going to be able to get some video of that and to see exactly what's what happens during the course of that hearing. It's been put off a few times. I, I'm assuming that you're right that it's tomorrow. But in any event, the issues around that, I think we definitely need to cover because we covered that trial for six weeks. So I think all of us are kind of invested and interested in that case. So I think we definitely need to look at that. The question was whether or not she had intentionally shown a blown up version of a report that was under seal. And she did it on her computer facing the gallery so that people would see it during the course of her trial. And she was charged with contempt of court. And they're now a different judge is going to be looking at it. And it's very interesting. And I definitely will get back to it, Marlo. Uh, Freedom Ring. Shouldn't we be able to tell the time of the text about freezing to death? Can't we determine objectively which calculation of time is accurate? Right? <laughs> right? And according to the defense, the FBI sides with them. There is an objective answer. The state's witness said that uh, she said that there can be errors, but the defense witness, I believe, will say there can be an error, sure, of a matter of just a tiny, very small amount of time. But when you delete it, there's this backup in the old version of the program that we use to extract data from Apple, which doesn't share or play nicely to with law enforcement on that score, that the program we use was updated. The old version didn't pull out that, that backup of deleted information, but the newer version did. And so when the newer version did it, it found that this text message had been sent earlier. It's critical. I mean, it is absolutely critical. It has to be the, determine and it has to be determined accurately. It's 
really, really important. And you hate to see experts just come in and say the opposite, because I agree with you that there's got to be a correct answer. That There is an answer on that. All right. I think I, I said one more. <laughs> I think I said two more questions a couple of questions ago, but let me do one or two more. Um, so how do you want snow was alcohol in the house as well? Probably, but I don't know that. I haven't seen anything that would answer that question one way or the other. Um, Camille wants to know about my impression of the judge. I don't really have an impression yet. I don't think I've seen enough to have an impression yet. She certainly seems to be listening, taking in all the, all of the information, but I don't really have an opinion. Freedom Reigns wants to know that, uh, that it's not necessarily vehicular manslaughter. That's not really a question. I think this is Freedom Reigns' opinion saying that, if he didn't make it inside and was just walking there and she hit him, it, it might not be vehicular manslaughter. We'll just have to wait and see kind of what facts come out at trial to determine that. Mary wants to know, could he have had more to drink at the party, stumbled outside, passed out and hit his head? Yes, I would say that would be a possibility. He would have to be in that exact spot. But yeah, I think that's possibility because that is what the autopsy report said was that it was from the blow on the back of the head that fr shattered, fractured the skull and that caused the bleeding. And then there was also hypothermia on top of that. So don't forget, we go live. Uh, first of all, I want to say, <laughs> I've forgotten the last few times, I really appreciate uh, Marlon and Mama Pinks who come every time, do our chat, make it a nice, pleasant place, make sure that people are enjoying it and friendly and kind. I so appreciate that. I also appreciate you. This is the best chat on the internet because people are really kind and nice and they want to learn and they want to know facts and know the truth. And I so appreciate that. So don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. We go live Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, sometimes extra. So always look out for a notice on that. If you subscribe with notifications on, you'll get the notice and I will see you tomorrow at, uh, sorry, I'll see you Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Showed it to jury. And so you can get a pretty good look at it too. Red blood-like substance on it. He said it was even wet and leaking everywhere. That was a quote. Zip ties, a razor blade. Why were these items there? And then the back window is a bobblehead of Alec Murdoch going back and forth.